Good morning. Uh, today's scripture reading will be in John uh, chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. Uh, you can find that on, if you want to follow along in a pew Bible, you can find that on page 1687. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I do believe in Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this morning why, very seriously, why I have believed in Jesus for many years and even though I have had my times of struggle, <clears throat> and I'm not going to stand here and tell you <clears throat> that there are not times in my life where I've struggled with some doubt, I have continued to decide over the years to follow Jesus. And the reasons I'm going to give you today are some of mine, and uh, <clears throat> pardon me, hope you'll, hopefully there'll be some of yours as well. Jesus said, uh, as many, or John said, John's, uh, Jesus' disciple said, uh, as many as received Jesus, to them gave he the power to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We heard the reading from Christopher of, of Thomas who was confronted by his fellow disciples with the message, we've seen the Lord Jesus risen from the dead. Thomas, like many of us, said, you've got to be kidding me. He said, unless I see the prints of the nails in his hands and feel the hole in his side, I'll never, ever believe. <clears throat> what will it take for you to believe? Not just to believe intellectually, but to commit your life to Jesus Christ. This has been a month for Broadway of faith building, of faith affirming with the Creation Evolution Seminar. And we want to continue that this morning. Uh, the Gospel of John was written, says John 20, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that as you believe, as you keep on believing, that's the thing you have to do. See, sometime in your life, maybe you made a decision to follow Jesus. But John said, as you keep on believing, you will have life through his name. I'm going to give you some reasons why I have decided this uh, through my life to believe in Jesus. One of them is this. I believe in Jesus because the New Testament testifies of him. And you say, well, whoopee do. The Bible says a lot of things. Why should I buy it? You know, Rudy Arguero was eating lunch with some of us this last week, and he talked about when his brother Miguel uh, had gone to San Salvador and El Salvador to go to university. Uh, with the own, they had to spend all their family's extra money to send Miguel to university. The family didn't have any extra money for anything. And when Miguel came back from San Salvador on the weekends, he brought with him a strange black book. And Miguel would sit there at the table at home in their little village reading this strange black book. And the other people in the family, seven children, they didn't know what the black book was. They'd never seen one before. That strange black book that Miguel Arguera was reading 
which led him to become a Christian, which then led his brothers and his father and mother to become a Christian, which led five men to become preachers, which led hundreds and hundreds of people to become Christians in El Salvador. That strange black book, the New Testament, is actually a collection of ancient documents that we have from the first century. In fact, this little a papyrus that you see on the screen there is the John Rylands papyrus dated from about 100 A.D. when the Apostle John was still alive, proving conclusively, scientifically, empirically that the New Testament is actually a first century document. We have numerous copies of the New Testament, like this ancient uh, manuscript of the Gospel of John from the 200s. In fact, today... We have discovered and cataloged and photographed between five and 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in the original language, Greek. And we have every reason to believe what John wrote in John 21, verse 24, when he wrote his gospel and he said, Now this is the disciple that bears witness to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. You see, it really is true that these ancient documents, which we call the New Testament, are actual records from the first century, from people that actually knew Jesus of Nazareth personally, or who actually associated with people who knew Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let that soak in. The New Testament is not a fairy tale. It is the result of actual New Testament time, first century records. Number two today, I believe in Jesus and have for many years because multiple sources confirm the basic facts of the Jesus story. We sing an old hymn, tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. And that's all true. But I'm wanting to tell you that that story is not only told by New Testament writers from the first century, but it's also told by Jewish writers that were never Christians. And it's also told by Roman writers that hated Christianity. It's triangulated by those different sources that are so far separate that the basic facts of it are definitely true, just as true as the fact that Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States or that there was a civil war. They all corroborate. Let me give you some examples. Tacitus, the Roman historian, didn't believe in Christianity, was part of the group that persecuted Christianity. He wrote about Nero in the decade of the 60s, and he said this in his annals. Tacitus lived A.D. 55 to 120. Nero substituted as culprits a class of men whom the crowd styled Christians. Now, doesn't Acts 11.26 say that the disciples were called what, church? Christians. First at Antioch. Christus, which is the Latin way of saying Christ, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Isn't that interesting? Luke 3, verse 1 says it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, that Jesus' ministry began. He was killed, he says, by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. All four Gospels say that Pontius Pilate was the one that killed him. So says Tacitus. Uh, you can tell how uh, Tacitus felt about Christianity. He says the pernicious superstition, that's Christianity, was checked for a moment only to break out again not merely in Judea, the home of the disease. Now, where does Acts say that the church began? Wasn't it in Jerusalem, in Judea, on the day of Pentecost? Isn't that amazing? And Tacitus says the same thing. But it also even reached the capital of Rome. And didn't the Apostle Paul write a letter to the church at where, church? At Rome, that we call the book of Romans? He did, <clears throat> didn't he? That's interesting to me. It strengthens my faith. A totally separate source, Flavius Josephus, who was born in A.D. 37, he wrote that Pilate, 
upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Tacitus say that the governor Pilate killed him? Doesn't the New Testament say that? Isn't that also what Josephus says? And Josephus says he was accused by men of the highest standing. Now, it seems like Matthew and the rest of those guys said it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the elders of the Jews that accused him and brought him. Isn't that what the New Testament says too? Amazing, isn't it? He was condemned to be crucified, he said. In Josephus' work called The Antiquities of the Jews, which is 20 volumes long, Josephus mentions about 20 different individuals whose names are Jesus. And among those 20 different individuals, he mentions Jesus, who was called the Christ or the Messiah. Hmm. And if you look in his book, Antiquities, in book 18 of the Antiquities, this is what Josephus wrote in the middle of the first century about this Jesus of Nazareth. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who, su- who performed surprising deeds. Now, doesn't our gospel tell about him turning water into wine and raising the dead and healing the sick and doing all those kinds of things? He performed surprising deeds and he was a teacher, do tell, of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks and he was called the Messiah. Then he says, and when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease like Peter and John and like those others. He appeared to them on the third day restored to life. Isn't that what the Gospels say? For the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians so called after him. Now Tacitus called it a pernicious superstition, didn't he? And he said, there's still Christians everywhere, even in Rome. And so says Josephus, the Christians so called after him still to this day have not disappeared. Add to these, add to the writings of Josephus and Tacitus and the writings of the New Testament. Add the writings of the the Latin writer Suetonius Tranquillus, the governor of Bithynia, Pliny the Younger, all pagans. Add to those a host of early Christian writings, all of which testify to the basic facts of the story of Jesus, which we have in our Gospels. Folks, this is not a long, long time ago in a far-off galaxy. This is real stuff from the first century, corroborated by many different sources. I'm trying to tell you that you have every reason to believe that the Jesus story is a true story. I believe in Jesus because the story of Jesus is filled with real characters of established history. Herod the Great, Roman Senate says that in A.D. 37 or so, he was confirmed by the Roman Senate as king of the Jews. Isn't that strange that Matthew says Herod had a conniption when the wise men came and said, where is he that is born, what, king of the Jews? That was Herod's title, and he didn't want to share it with anyone else. How about Tiberius Caesar? Luke says clearly in Luke 3, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, Tiberius Caesar came to power in A.D. 14. Add 15 to that. What do you get? You get A.D. 29. Okay? How about Annas, the high priest, that Jesus was dragged to his place to be interviewed and and tried. Annas, the great leader of the high priesthood in the first century, became high priest in A.D. 6. We know this from Jewish sources. He was high priest till A.D. 14. We know this outside the Bible. His son-in-law, Joseph Caiaphas, which you also read about in the Gospels. Jesus was taken to to Caiaphas to be interviewed. Joseph Caiaphas happened to have become high priest in A.D. 26. And that makes it just perfect if Jesus was crucified around A.D. 29 or 30 or 31 because Joseph Caiaphas really was the high priest, just like the Gospels say. What about Gamaliel, the teacher at whose feet 
uh, sat Saul of Tarsus during the time of Jesus. The Mishnah, completely outside the New Testament, the teachings of the rabbis from 200 B.C. to 200 A.D., mentions Gamaliel as one of the teachers of the law at that time. And the New Testament says Paul studied at his feet. Another corroboration of sources. Quirinius, the governor of Syria that Luke mentions in Luke chapter 2, who was making the census that caused everybody to enroll for taxation when Jesus was born. Just like the Bible says. See? Just like the Bible says. Pontius Pilate. Oh yeah, Pontius Pilate. Everybody said he's the guy that killed Jesus, don't they? Did you know that we know from Roman sources that Pontius Pilate replaced Valerius Gratus as procurator of Judea in A.D. 26? He started out at Caesarea at the seacoast. That was the Roman capital during part of the year. He moved his headquarters to Jerusalem during the winter months or vice versa. Uh, Caesarea during the winter months and and Jerusalem in in the other time. He caused all kinds of trouble among the Jewish people. He was finally deposed after he killed too many people and sent back to Rome in A.D. 36. Now listen to this. The the reign of of Caiaphas, exactly right in time. The reign of, of Pilate, exactly the right time. All of these things come together. All these historical sources... And Luke is spot on telling us exactly when all this stuff came together and exactly when Jesus lived. This is not accidental. This is not a long time ago in a far off galaxy. These are real human beings that are part of the story of Jesus. This lends credence, folks, to the historicity of the story. I'm a linear, logical thinker, and much to many of y'all's chagrin. But my mind tells me, not just my heart, my mind tells me that I have reason to believe that all of this is true. And I'm telling you this because it comes at great cost when you give your life to Jesus. I believe in Jesus because the ancient Christians were convicted to the point of giving up their lives. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 13, we believe. And therefore do we speak, and he really did. Why did James, the Lord's brother, and Jude, or Judas, Jesus' brother, become Christians? In John 7, 5, they didn't believe in Jesus. Why did they become Christians? What's your explanation for that? Could it be that they saw him after he raised from the dead? Why did Paul, who had such a brilliant career in Judaism, who was trained by Gamaliel, the great rabbi, who, who was a member of the Sanhedrin court who had everything going for him. Why did he give it all up and become a Christian? Why did it become a movement for the entire world in the first century? There was no political gain in becoming a Christian. In fact, it was illegal from the beginning. It was persecuted from the beginning by the Jews and then by the Romans. There was no military backing of Christianity Uh, They did not take anybody's territory or have any military threat for anyone. There was no financial gain in being a Christian. In fact, you could lose everything financially for being a Christian. So why, 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 why did these people, were they that stupid? Were they so gullible? Why did so many of them become Christians and give their lives during the time of Nero and Domitian and Decius and Diocletian? Until in 313, Christianity was legalized. What caused it to persist for 300 years of persecution? Well, I think the reason is they really believed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 3, a verse before this begins, here's what Paul wrote. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead the third day, according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to above 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to the rest of the uh, disciples. And last of all, as unto a child born out of due time, he appeared to me as well. Paul knew that Jesus was alive. He died preaching that Jesus was alive. 
And so did those ancient Christians. They knew it was true. That's why they followed it, and that's why I follow him as well. I believe Jesus because his teachings comprise the highest philosophy of life. Not all of my reasons are intellectual. Some of my reasons are practical and emotional. As I read and understand the teachings of Jesus, and more so as I watch people who really live the teachings of Jesus. Oh, I know a lot of people wear the name Christian that don't live Christian. I'm talking about people who have Jesus in their hearts and live Jesus. They've got the best marriages in the world if they really are living Jesus. They make the very best friends I've ever known if they really live Jesus because they're doing what Jesus said. They have the best families that I've ever seen if they really live Jesus. They're the best workers to have working with you or for you in the business world because they take to heart the principles of Jesus. They are people that I would trust because they're trying to do what's right in the sight of Jesus. There's no other philosophy in the world that produces the kind of people that Jesus' teaching produces. They weather trials and storms of life better than anybody I've ever seen. That helps me to believe in the divinity of the Lord Jesus. And then next... I believe in Jesus because his unselfish love draws me to him. Oh, when I was a little boy, I used to listen to preachers. And I'd listen to them tell the simple gospel of how God loved us and how God sent his son. That simple verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I heard that gospel story and I wondered how God could love sinners like us but realized that he did. And Jesus said before he was crucified, and I, if I am lifted up on the cross from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. The love of God that was displayed at the cross is the most powerful drawing thing that ever was to draw people to dedicate themselves to him. Aside from all of the other evidence, aside from all the scientific and historical stuff, no one can help but be touched by the love of God at the cross. He that spared not his own son, wrote Paul, but freely delivered him up for all of us, shall he not also freely with him give us everything? God committed his own love while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That story is a story that's powerful, and that's why I believe in Jesus. Lastly today, I believe in Jesus because of the eternal purpose of God. Y'all, any of y'all have uh, a post-trunk or treat uh, hangover this morning? Some of y'all may have a different kind of hangover. I don't know. But I'm glad you're here anyway. If you have post-trunk or treat uh, recovery this morning, let me tell you something. Life is difficult. Many days in our life, The things that we go through make it hard to get up out of bed. Let me tell you why I can keep getting up out of bed every day. Because I have a purpose in this world. Ephesians 1, 9 through 11 says that God planned the entire universe and the entire world and humanity and everything else because of his eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The whole Bible is pointing toward Jesus. The whole purpose of man is to be redeemed in Jesus Christ. Our whole purpose on this earth is to live for Jesus and to help in whatever way we can for his people to carry out his mission. And I love to get up every day knowing that my life has a reason, it has a purpose, it has a mission. I have a reason to live and I have a reason to work and a reason to to influence my children and grandchildren and to teach other people. I believe in Jesus because Jesus gives me the greatest purpose in the world for my life. And that's why you ought to believe in Jesus too. Now, I don't know where you are in your life and I don't know where you are in your faith. But I wanted to tell you today some of the things that keep me being a Christian. As Danny said, when we have the Lord's Supper that keep me uh, deciding every week again, I'm going to serve Jesus until I die. 
Do you want to serve Jesus? Do you want to obey the gospel of Christ? Can we help you or pray for you in some way today? Please come as we stand together and as we sing.